Welcome to Algebra 2, Section 9.3, Trigonometric Functions of Any Angle. So let's go over what we just have covered so far in this chapter. What we learned about uh, trig ratios in geometry and, uh, and how the, those like Soka Toa elements, you know, opposite over adjacent, opposite over hypotenuse, things like that, how um, if I had an angle as an input, I could get those as an output. Um, however, when we're talking about just a triangle, a figure drawn in space, there's, there's no real bearing to it. We can't have angles that are greater than 180, otherwise it won't produce a triangle. Um, so we start seeing all these uh, little things that could creep up. We can't have negative angle measures if that's the case because we're just talking about a triangle in space. We're not talking about something happening on the coordinate plane. So then what do we do? We move into how to draw angles on the coordinate plane. And we learn about things like negative angles and uh, coterminal angles, angles where we can rotate you know, more than one time around and uh, the initial side and the terminal side um, of an angle in standard position. So it is possible if you were to take a calculator and type in the sine of 740, um, 740 degrees, you would get an output, um, which is weird because we couldn't have an, a triangle that has 740 degree angle inside. So we kind of need those two to come together um, in order to talk about having any angle measure we want produce an output for sine, cosine, tangent, etc. So that's what we're going to be exploring today. All right. So how to construct a reference triangle. So our first step is going to be to draw the angle in its standard position. All right. So here you can see we've got an angle that we could not make a right triangle out of. If we have our initial side going off on the positive x-axis, that theta could not make a right triangle. So what we do is we construct what we call a reference triangle. We draw a line, and it must be perpendicular to the x-axis, and that creates a right triangle. This angle that's inside the triangle and is formed at the vertex, you can see it's, it's labeled theta, and then with a little apostrophe, that means theta prime like a transformation's been done, that is a reference angle. And now you can see that using that uh, kind of fuchsia colored uh, theta, we are able to make a right triangle and now we can use our Sokotoa. Um, this is a really, really interesting thing and, and I challenge you when we go through examples, type them into your calculator to check them and, and confirm that sure enough, this, this reference triangle that has a, that, that reference angle, theta prime, it has the same sine value that if I were to actually type in the obtuse angle theta into the sine function, we get the same result. So we can use this triangle for reference to tie the two together. Now, the unit circle. How do we take this idea of Sokotoa dealing with these triangles that are just kind of floating in space, opposite leg, adjacent leg, the hypotenuse, and how do we turn that into something that's happening on an xy coordinate plane? Well, the unit circle is one where we have, you know, just kind of imagining, you can see it drawn here, imagining, imagining our terminal side being, uh, you know, kind of revolved around the origin to produce all these different angles. And we just say, well, what if there was a circle with radius 1? And we use that to determine what, um, what little reference triangles were being made by that angle. Um, surely we could scare, uh, scale this up to, uh, to, to show any different you know, size of triangle that we wanted, so it's, it's still applicable. Those ratios are going to be the same. But what we start to look at is, let's say we're here inside the triangle with our, our reference angle theta prime. Well, now the opposite over the hypotenuse becomes the height of that point, right, the y value, how high is it above the x-axis, over the radius because the radius is making the hypotenuse of that triangle. And if we use the unit circle and we say that that radius is 1, then sine theta is just going to be the y value of that point because it would be y divided by 1. Okay, And then cosecant theta would just be 1 over y, the reciprocal of that. The cosine of theta, I guess I should use primes here because we're using our reference triangle, the cosine, well, that's the adjacent side. That's measuring the x value over to that point on the unit circle. And it's over that radius, which if we're on the unit circle, that radius is 1. Okay. 
And here's the kicker, tangent. Tangent is y over x, but if we think about it, y over x, that's rise over run. The tangent is the slope of the hypotenuse. Interesting, interesting stuff. And now we can see, hey, we got, we got, uh, we've got a sine value that's like negative three fifths. Well, that can happen now because our x coordinates are allowed to move in the negative direction, as are our y coordinates. What if we had a, an angle that went all the way through down here? Well, then this x value and, the, or sorry, this x value and this y value would be like a negative four and a negative three. We can have that now because we can be in all four quadrants. So a really nice way of taking this reference triangle, tying it to the right triangle tree we did in 9.1, and then moving it onto the xy coordinate plane to explain some of those things like, how can I have a, a sine ratio that's negative? How can I have a cosine ratio that's negative or a tangent that's negative? It makes sense. All right, so example one. Here we're not on the unit circle, but we do have little reference triangles that are being set up here. They give us a point uh, in problem number four, five negative 12. Let's connect that point to the x-axis. Well, if it's x comma y, that means my x value is five and it's headed in a positive direction. The y value is negative 12. And if I use Pythagorean theorem, that hypotenuse has a length of 13. It's a Pythagorean triple of 5, 12, 13, or, I mean, just running through Pythagorean theorem would solve that for us. But now let's take a look. Our little reference angle inside, the one that's happening inside that reference triangle at the origin, there's our theta prime. So the sign of that big red um, angle that we've rotated that terminal side through, the sign of that is going to be the exact same as the sign of my reference angle. They're just coterminal. So the sine of theta is going to be negative 12 over 13. Cosecant will just be its reciprocal. Cosine will be positive 5 over 13. That's adjacent over hypotenuse. Or if I think about it as the unit circle, that's x over r. Because when I found that 13, that's really the radius of this circle I'm tracing through. Secant will be its reciprocal. Tangent, opposite over adjacent, or y over x, negative 12 fifths. And doesn't that make sense? Look at how steeply negative the hypotenuse of that reference triangle is going. Perfect. Cotangent is its reciprocal, negative 5 twelfths. All right, let's try number six. This one just doesn't come out uh, as a perfect Pythagorean triple. But here you can see, if I drop that point directly down to the x-axis, I'm just going to draw that off to the side so I can label it a little bit better. Here, my theta, it didn't need a reference triangle because it's happening in quadrant one. If I drop that down to the x-axis, there's no angle for reference because the angle is the one we want. Well, my x-coordinate was three, my y-coordinate was one, and then if I want to imagine here's the origin, there's my angle going off. Pythagorean theorem will find that radius. It's square root 10. All right, so my, my sine value opposite over hypotenuse is 1 over root 10, which if I rationalize will be root 10 over 10. Cosecant is its reciprocal. Cosine would be 3 over root 10, or if we rationalize, 3 root 10 over 10. Secant would be its reciprocal, root 10 over 3. Tangent, that's my rise over run, 1 third. Cotangent is its reciprocal, 3 over 1.
And I really hope we start to think, I, I'm, I know I'm using terms like opposite adjacent hypotenuse and stuff, but I really hope we're starting to tie that into X's, Y's, and R's, this radius being made as we spin this point uh, around the origin. Very, very cool stuff. All right, our second example, use the unit circle to evaluate the six trig functions of theta. All right. So the first one, 540 degrees. There's no angle drawn, so I, I'm tasked with that. Well, 540 degrees, let's see, that's a full 360 and 180 more. Hmm, so I'm looking at no way to draw a reference triangle. I can't connect that with the x-axis. It's already on there. So where would the unit circle cross the x-axis? Well, it would be the point negative 1, 0 where that terminal side is, right? I'm one unit away from the origin, but I'm off to the left. So that would be the point where it crosses. Well, now I know that my x value is negative 1, my y value is 0, and the radius, since I'm on the unit circle, is 1. Sine is y over r. Cosecant is r over y. That's 1 divided by 0. So that's undefined. My cosine, well, that's x on r. My secant, the reciprocal of that. My tangent is y over x, 0. And hey, doesn't that make a perfect 0 horizontal slope? Perfect. That makes sense. Cotangent is the reciprocal of that, 1 over 0, undefined. Now, this is a special type of angle when, when your terminal side falls directly on an axis, like we saw here, this is called a quadrantal angle. When you have quadrantal angles, you will usually see undefined results, zeros, ones. You won't see the nice fractions or decimals like we're used to seeing or the radicals or anything like that. We couldn't set up a reference triangle, so we have to use the clean values of like a 1 or negative 1, a 0, um, and then a 1 is our radius for x, y, and r to make that happen. So you typically see those results when you have a quadrantal angle. Number 12, hey, here we've got a radian measure. Well, let's think. This would be 0 radians. I'm just trying to make it easier to draw here. 90 degrees, well, 180 degrees is pi radians, so 90 would be half of pi or pi over 2. 180 is pi, and then 270, that would be 3 pi over 2, and then all the way back around full circle would be 2 pi. So if I want 7 pi over 2, well, let's see, here's my initial side, 1 pi over 2, 2 pi is over 2, 3 pi over 2, 4 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, 6 pi over 2, 7 pi over 2, it's another quadrantal angle. This would be the point 0, negative 1, so my x is 0, my y is negative 1, and my radius, since I'm on the unit circle, is 1. All right, so what's my sign? Well, that's y on r. So secant is its reciprocal. My cosine, x on r. Secant, its reciprocal. My tangent, y on x. And that should make perfect sense. It's going straight up and down. What's the slope of a vertical line? It's undefined. Man, this makes sense. Cotangent is its reciprocal. So instead of y on x, this is x on y. That's going to be 0. Awesome. All right, example 3. Here we've got... Um, two different types of angles that we're going to be drawing in, and then we want to find its reference angle. Thankfully, we don't have to find all those trig ratios once we're there, um, but we're just going to sketch it and find the reference angle that we would use if we were to calculate sine, cosine, tangent, etc. for it. So for the first one, negative 370 degrees. Here's my initial side. I'm rotating in a negative direction. A full circle would be 360. I'm going just a little bit past that. 
So here's my 370 degree rotation in the negative direction. The reference angle inside, let's do that in blue. If I were to connect this with the x-axis, there's my reference triangle. So the reference angle inside is going to just be a 10 degree angle. So I'm going to call it a, a yeah, yeah, negative 10 because it is below the x-axis. Number 20. Ooh, oh, why is my number 10? I'm thinking for this reference angle, we're just going to call that a 10 degree angle instead of negative 10. Because if we're trying to turn a, a revolving terminal side into a reference triangle to use, well, that triangle can only have positive angle measures inside. Um, so we're just going to use a positive angle measure for what's inside that triangle. We're just using it for reference anyway. Number 20, 8 pi over 3. Okay, again, 180 is pi. Just until I get these down, I'm going to keep labeling this every single time. I got my initial side drawn in there. Let's see. This would be 6 pi over 3. 7 pi over 3, 8 pi over 3, be about right there. Okay, now, how did you know that it's going to end up in quadrant 2? Well, here's how I like to think about it. If I'm just looking at the top, if I know this is going from 0 to pi, let's say I was trying to graph 2 pi over 3. What I want to do is say, how can I take this entire rotation and break it into thirds? Well, here I've got one, two, three equal divisions. So when I'm dividing by three, I know that I have to skip on the second one over three. I need to skip over that, uh, that y-axis. I kind of call it the gas gauge way of, of thinking about moving it through. Is, oh, I've got about you know, one-third of a tank left or something like that. All right, so what would my reference angle be? Let's finish asking or answering the question here. If I connect that to the x-axis, then inside here, I've got my reference angle theta prime. And because it landed, you know, it looks like two-thirds of the way between 0 and pi, I know that what's left over is going to be 1 pi over 3. Now, I know there's some students out there probably being like, Mr. Hartz, I, you know, I, I see what you're doing, but I just can't do that kind of fraction work in my head. Is there a way that I can mathematically do this? And, and sure, there is. Uh, so we drew an 8 pi over 3 radian angle, but we found that that was over a full rotation. So we need to subtract out that full rotation, which gives me 2 pi over 3. Okay, so what's left over between that 2 pi over 3 and getting to 180? Well, I would take pi minus 2 pi over 3. Well, pi is 3 pi over 3. If I take away 2 pi over 3, then I'm left with 1 pi over 3. So a little of it is visualizing the fractions, but there is a mathematical way. As long as we know those benchmarks um, of each angle measure in radians, 0 pi over 2 pi, 3 pi over 2, then we can use simple addition and subtraction to find out what that missing angle measure should be. All right, example four, evaluate the function without using a calculator. So whenever we see without using a calculator, it means that we're going to have either a quadrantal angle or a special right triangle. It's something that we should be able to draw up and know what the ratios of the sides will be. All right, so... Um, I guess just to make this easier for you to see, I'm going to draw a couple thumbnail sets of axes here. For number 26, 240 degrees, let's draw that angle. Initial side, 
there's 180 and I've got to go a little bit further. So there we have 240 degrees. Well, that can't make a triangle as is, so I'm going to have to make a reference triangle instead, connect it to the x-axis. There's my reference triangle. And here I went some measure past 180, so my reference angle is the 60 degrees past 180 that I went. Okay, now I'm going to have to be aware, too, that the x and the y are both going in the negative direction. The slope of that hypotenuse is sloping upwards, so I'm expecting a positive tangent coming from a negative over negative y over x. Okay, so if I've got a 60 degree reference angle inside, it means I set up a 30, 60, 90 special right triangle. Across from the 60, I would have the root 3 leg. Okay. Adjacent to the 60, I would have the leg that was length 1. And the hypotenuse would be length 2. So from this reference, I find that the tangent of my theta prime would be a positive root 3. Or sorry, I guess because I label the sides as going in negative directions, it would be negative root 3 over negative 1. It's a positive root 3. And just for kicks, my calculator is still in degree mode. I'm going to type in tangent 240, and I get 1.732. Then I'm going to type in square root 3. Hey, 1.732. So we did get the correct answer. That's a nice way uh, to kind of check using a calculator. But we did all the work without one. For number 32, I want the secant of 11 pi over 6. Well, just think, 2 pi would be 12 pi over 6, so I am almost to that. Start off on my initial side, I rotate through, and I almost get to a full circle. Okay, so that was 11 pi over 6. What was left over inside, that's what's going to make my reference triangle. That's the angle I'm going to use. Well, what was left over inside that theta prime is equal to 1 pi over 6. There would be 1 pi over 6 remaining to get me to that complete circle. All right. Well, pi over 6, well, if pi is 180, if I take 180 and divide that by 6, then I get a 30-degree reference triangle. So this is another 30, 60, 90. So I'm going to label the side lengths in the ratio that a 30, 60, 90 holds. So across from that reference angle, pi over 6, that's a 30-degree angle. I would have a side length of 1, but it's going in a negative direction. And I would have a root 3, and that's going in a positive x direction. <clears throat> and then the hypotenuse would be 2. Really helpful to think of this in terms of x, y, and r. Remember, that radius, it's a positive distance from the origin always. It nev never has a sign attached to it. It's always positive. All right, so to find the secant here, let's look at the secant of our reference triangle. That's going to be hypotenuse over adjacent. That's 2 over root 3 or 2 root 3 over 3. And if we didn't remember secant, we could just find its cosine and take the reciprocal. It's nice how, how quickly these all tie together. And again, just for kicks, I'm going to try this in a calculator. Um, I don't have a secant key, so I'm going to do 1 divided by the cosine of, boom. And I've got 11 pi over 6. If I convert that to degrees, that would be 330 degrees. Again, since my calculator is still in degree mode. And I get 1.154. Well, now let's see what happens if I type in 2 root 3 divided by 3, I get 1.1504, or sorry, 1.154. So the answer checks out. All the work that we did there is leading us in the right direction. Um, the biggest mistake students make is they forget to put these negative signs in place. Remember, you're dealing on an, with an xy coordinate plane, so your x's and y's can go off in positive or negative directions. 
really tempting just to label it one root three two and, and then start doing your trig. Make sure you have the correct signs. Make sure your answer makes sense. Um, so the, the one general rule of thumb that I have is you'll hear this later in the chapter too. Sign is Y is height. So if we have a sign value and it's ending up being positive or something, that reference triangle had better been drawn in the upper two quadrants, quadrant one or quadrant two. Cosine is left and right. So if I, you know, finding an answer and my triangle is drawn off to the left and to the uh, drawn off to the left, I'd better have negative values there because those are where the negative x's, the left values are happening. Um, so that's a really nice, just quick check to have in place. And then of course tangent is the slope. So if we were trying to find the tangent of number 32, once I drew that angle in, I, I had better be expecting a negative tangent to show up because that hypotenuse is sloping downward. Many, many patterns that make this work very fast, very easy. And example five, our final example for this section. A Ferris wheel has a radius of 75 feet. You board a car at the bottom of the Ferris wheel, which is 10 feet above the ground. Rotate 255 degrees counterclockwise before the ride temporarily stops. How high above the ground are you when the ride stops? Uh, so let's just pause for a second and, and answer that question first. We've got the ground, we've got 10 feet, and we've got our Ferris wheel that's hopefully more centered than that drawing is. Ferris wheel has a radius of 75 feet. If, just going to draw in some axes there, if we start here and we rotate 255 degrees counterclockwise, well, there's 180, so we'd go another 75 degrees. There's where we end up after our 255 degree trip. How high are we above the ground now? So what we want is that value. And I shouldn't use X, I'm going to use H instead. Because we're going to imagine this happening on a xy coordinate plane. So here we've got this reference triangle happening inside. And we need to use some angle addition to figure out, hey, what's, what's our little reference angle in there? All right. Well, if we go 255 degrees from top to bottom, we said that here this was how far past 180. That's 75 degrees. So 15 degrees is our reference angle inside. All right. So here, let's just pull that little triangle out. So we've got a 70, 70, not 17, 75 foot radius. And we know there's a 15 degree reference angle inside. We need to find that little piece over there. Well, to do that, the sine of 15 degrees, right? Trying to find height, makes sense that we're using sine. That equals that unknown y value over 75. Okay, to solve that for y, I'm going to take 75 times the sine of 15. And I get 19.41. And that is also in feet. So now to answer that first question, our total height above the ground is the 10 feet that the ride was off the ground plus the 75 feet of radius, right? So we got 10 feet here and 75 here, and then the y value we just found. So we are 104.41 feet above the ground. Okay, and then secondly it says, if the radius of the Ferris wheel is doubled, is your height above the ground 
doubled. Well, let's see about how that changes our situation here because now we've still got a 15 degree reference angle. We've got a 150 degree radius now, or sorry, 150 foot radius now. So this Y value would be 150 times sine 15. That's 38.82. Okay. Well, that certainly looks like it's doubled what our Y value was before, so I'm tempted to say yes, but remember, we're, we're looking at height above the ground. So let's see, our total height H would be the 10 feet off the ground that the ride is, plus 150, plus that 38.82 that we just found. And I get 198. Point eight two feet. So no, the the height off the ground is not doubled um, because we have this constant of ten feet that that doesn't change. If that were to change to twenty feet off the ground, then we totally would have a doubling, but because that 10 feet remains constant, the change in the Ferris wheel doesn't affect that part of our height. So it's almost doubled, but not quite. All right, so a little bit of word problem. Man, I just love when geometry and algebra comes together like this. It's so cool, and it should really open up some doors. If any of you are um, considering taking physics classes, they use sines and cosines all the time to break down um, forces and see how they act on one another. It, it's a very, very cool part of mathematics that you really have barely scratched the surface of. So uh, I hope we are able to appreciate this as we go through and just see what types of questions we're able to answer now. Very cool stuff. That does it for section 9.3. Here's a look at your assignment.